Today we continue our study in the book of 1 Corinthians and today we're in chapter 6 and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 8. Of course this is a Pauline epistle, one of the groupings of the New Testament letters and books that is written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, we of course... Uh, know the theme of the book, that it's uh, Christian conduct, and Paul has been writing about problems that he knows about and problems that they have asked him about in the church at Corinth, and he's trying to uh, give them God's wisdom and God's will about how to correct these things that are wrong in their church or how to teach them where they need information about these issues. And so we see that today again. This is, not, uh, this is not of vital importance, perhaps, compared to chapter 5. This is, he's not dealing with a gross immorality here, but he's, he, he is dealing with a symptom of their failure to live the life of Christ in their church and in their personal lives. And their pride and their uh, bickerings and their uh, disputes in the church and they're failing to institute uh, godly standards and to, uh, and to uh, promote and insist on personal purity in their church is an indication of their fleshly Christian life. They were living in the power of their own self. And, and friend, that's always the problem, you see. That new nature in us does not do things that God does not want done. It's the old nature that does that and, and we are so often in that old nature. And if we live a long time like that, if we live weeks and months and, and years in the power of that thing dominating, there are going to be severe problems that are going to occur because of that. And we're seeing this in the church at Corinth and it's just it's like today. They, they're a mess. They're just problems everywhere. Should not be. And Paul is dealing with them. And we need to deal with them in our church in 2001. And so we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. And then we want to read these eight verses of chapter 6. Heavenly Father, help us to see how much we need you in our life that our own wisdom and our own plans and our own doings are, are just bad for us and lead us into sin and cause problems. But that if we would live in the life of Christ that we could see the things that you want and we would have peace and joy and praise and worship and that we might see more people saved and that we might be able to do the work and get the knowledge of this book into the world and make a difference in many more lives. Lord, this is why you've left us here, to live for you, not to live for ourselves. And yet that old nature is such a part of us. That old nature is so strong and so present. Uh, the enemies of our own old nature and this world system and the the devil are so current and active that it, it is so very easy for that thing to be turned on in our lives. Without thinking, we adopt the attitudes and that we speak and act from the old nature that lives within us. But fellowship with thee and letting you live through us will uh, change that. And, and though we are still sinners, we can not be involved in the... the long-term results and the, the gross immorality or the great problems of sin, we can be kept from that and we can keep current on confessing our sin and we can be dominated as a normal thing more most by the Spirit of God so that the flesh is, is not very powerful in our life. And, but though it is such a powerful thing and so present that we need to fear it and, and check up on it and evaluate it constantly in our Christian life. Help us to do that today and in this 
matter that perhaps we haven't even thought about that occurred in the Christian church that, that we might learn and see how you want your people to live and how you want them to apply the truth of your person in your life in their lives. And we pray that you would help us to see that today. For it's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Dare any of you having a matter against another to go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, you are uh, unworthy to judge in the smallest matters. Know ye not that ye shall judge angels, how much more the things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, do ye set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church? I speak this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren? But a brother goeth to the law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to the law one with another. Why do you not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather allow yourself to be defrauded? Nay, ye do wrong and defraud, and that your brother. Paul uh, deals with this matter, and we want to talk about the circumstance of the matter. And the problem was that without trying to resolve civil disputes that occurred between them in the church and letting that be settled in the Christian community, that they were suing each other and trying to get a retribution and justice before unsaved people in the, the courts of human government and the Roman law. It's like if, uh, it's like that, uh, that they had an accident in the parking lot at Corinth and, and one Christian's car ran into another and without saying, well, brother, I'll do the right thing about this or, or, or even taking the loss and saying, well, it's my Christian brother, and if he doesn't want to do the right thing about fixing my car up, I'll just, I'll pay it, and I'll leave the result up to the Lord. And when there were fender benders at car, they took each other to court and tried to get the maximum benefit out of it they could. And they, of course, uh, would assume that the other person was at fault. And Paul isn't against here, and he isn't saying that we should not seek justice about disputes and, and harms that take place in the church, especially if we have first tried to settle them among Christians. And today, I would, I would not necessarily want to bow to the, any man's opinion to uh, settle matters in my life, but I would think that people at the church would have a better view of what's right and wrong and fair and not fair and, and godly and not just and unjust than an unsaved person would. And they weren't even trying to get these things resolved in the church. They were just automatically going down to the court. Or suppose two of the ladies at Corinth, I can imagine, who liked to dominate in the service, got in a little scuffle and one punched the other one in the mouth and they took each other to the court. Whatever the thing was, there was in the natural course of living and because they were not controlled with the spirit, Sometimes they weren't exactly friendly and nice like they ought to be and say, that's pretty much us, isn't it? We want to think it, oh, and we put on that thing on Sunday morning. Oh, it is so wonderful and we're so full of the love of Christ and we're so uh, godly and good and everything is sweet and wonderful and I hate that saying, it's all good. Well, friend, we're not all good and, and it's not all good about Randall Pugh and it's not all good about you, and when you get a bunch of not all goods together, some of that not all good's going to come out. And, and the people were taking the matters to the unsaved world around them instead of trying to save them. I see even a more important lesson than that here. I see standards being instituted in things that we shy away from, that we run from. 
Now, if a thing is private, we, we tend to say, well, that's their business. And it is, by the way. It's my responsibility to clean up my act and to live the way God wants me to. And it's not your responsibility to have to make me do that. But I ought to do that myself. And it's my responsibility. But if it's public and if it's known and if it's affecting God's testimony of His church in the world, then it needs to be dealt with by the public testimony of God's people in the world. If it's private, and it's my responsibility. But if it's known and it's sin and it's causing a, 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 a bad testimony for Christians, then it needs to be dealt with. And Paul said, there are standards to living the Christian life. We're afraid of standards, you see. We say it's their business. We don't want to get involved in that, that kind of thing. But it is the church's business if it's affecting the public testimony of the church and how the unsaved people view the change that's supposed to take place in God's children. And there are standards here, very strict standards that Paul lays down. And we're afraid of standards. Oh, let's don't make rules. We don't want to interfere in anybody's liberty in the church. Oh, we don't want to tell anybody what to do. And that's true. We don't, but God's Word does. And if you don't want standards, friend, you better, you're not going to live by the Bible. If you don't want doctrine and teaching, that's what the Bible is all about. And they had standards here. And they had principles here. And we're afraid of them in 2001, but we better not be. Because they are the structure that God uses to keep things the way He wants it in our lives and in the lives of our public testimony at the church where we go to. And listen, friend, if you say to your children, I love you, and you do, and you ought to, and love means a lot of different things, but if you love them the way God loves them, and I hope you do, you say to them, I've got your best interests at heart. You're my child. I want what's right and good and best for you, child. But because I love you, you can do anything you want to and that won't affect anything in our lives and our relationship together. You just, you know, you want to stay out all night? 16 years old? It's all right. After all, I love you. You want to uh, uh, smoke a little crack tonight? You want to get drunk and drive your car or get drunk and not drive your car? You want to have a little... Uh, uh, premarital sex in your life with, uh, you know, casual, it's, it's okay. We understand that, that there, there are impulses of that old nature and they are strong and exist in your life. We love you! You say, what kind of parents is that? Well, unfortunately, it's like a lot of parents today. But that's not the way God wants parents to love their children. In fact, that's a very poor one-sided kind of love because you know parents if you love your children you have to be not a buddy to them and not a chum and a friend you have to be the authority you have to be the parent and you set the bounds and you say this is right and this is wrong and and you don't without a good excuse stay out all hours of the night where you're going to get into trouble and you don't drink alcohol that's going to dominate your life. And you don't take drugs that are going to control and influence your behavior and your thinking. You don't do those things. And so they're harmful for you and, and we're going to set bounds because we love you. And real love has standards to it, friend. And real godliness has standards to it. God is holy. And the character of God has principles of right and wrong that are for our good. And in public worship and in our churches, we better have standards. We better have them, but we're afraid of them. But they're the very thing that we need here. And so we say today from this passage that Christians must judge disputes among themselves. It ought to be Christians that settle problems between Christians of a civil nature. And of course, if it's a, of a legal nature, if somebody murders somebody down at the church where you're at, and I, I hope that never happens, 
that they get angry and come in and shoot somebody with a gun, then the legal authority will have to take care of punishing him or her. It becomes a legal matter, but we're talking about civil disputes here, and these were matters where they were trying to get back payment for wrong they felt had been done to them in a civil court. And in verses <coughs> 1 through 3, Paul says, Christians will judge the world and angels. Now he says here, don't you understand that you are going to be judging the future world in the millennium, in your glorified, sinless states after you have been uh, changed and resurrected and made like the resurrected body of Christ and sin is no longer any part of you. We're going to be judging the world systems in the future. Paul said, don't you understand that? And he said, we're also going to be judging the evil angels and evaluating them that have sinned. We're going to be involved in judging angels and judging this world system. And what he's saying is, if we in the future are going to do that, God has given us the capacity and the ability and the wisdom of his word to do some judging now in some things. Now, I want to tell you that you cannot condemn and you cannot sit in the place of Christ and you cannot know the extent of sin in another person's life or the extent of praise to be heaped upon them. And that's not what we're talking about here. But here in Corinth and, and in just a chapter or two ago in chapter 3, he said that the mature Christian that's living and the power of Christ makes spiritual judgments about everything on the basis of the truth of the Word of God. We don't evaluate a person's guilt, and we don't evaluate a person's punishment for their sin, and that's not what he's talking about here. But he is talking about being able to make judgments and decisions that settle disputes and take care of problems and sins, and the church, so far as discipline and so far as saying what the Bible says about them and so far as resolving conflicts as much as possibly can. If a person steals, we are not judging them to say that is sin and wrong. The Bible says that. Now, determining the punishment for their sin in eternity is up to Christ. That's not worth an area of our responsibility. And that's not what he's talking about here. But he is saying that we have to make spiritual evaluations on the basis of truth and scripture and we must do that in our local churches. He says we're going to judge in the future the world and angels. And then in 4 and 5 he says that Christians should have wisdom to judge among the brethren now. He said if you're going to do that in the future, verse 4, <clears throat> you have judgments of things pertaining to life now. And he says uh, uh, you ought to value this and there, there are people in your church that ought to be wise enough to be appointed this work. And he kind of uses a little sarcasm and says here, well just set the person that's uh, that, that is the least esteem among you. Why would you do that? You've got wise people in your church and you've got mature people in your church and people that that understand the life of Christ and how the principles of the Word of God and they're the ones that have the wisdom to judge. And they ought to be able to help mediate the disputes between the people. And they ought to be able to help this person over here to understand what God has said and this person over here to understand what God has said. And when they understand what God has said and wants, then they can resolve the conflict between them civilly and not in a court of law. And Paul said there ought to be people in the church that are able to give that kind of guidance and that kind of wisdom. And that there ought to be uh, leadership in judging issues and conflicts between people within the church. And then in 6 through 8, he said Christians are better judges than unbelievers. And let's read those verses because there are a couple things here that are important. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Unbelievers do not know God. They do not know the principles of God. They do not understand 
right and wrong from the perspective of God. Now they may know certain things right and wrong and they may have some human wisdom. But a Christian has that and so much more. And friend, our problem is that we really don't believe that God is who He says He is and, and that He really knows what He's doing because we live our lives on the basis of our thinking or some other person's thinking. We raise our children on the basis of what Dr. Spock wrote in the book. And I don't... Uh, he may have become a Christian, but he wasn't a Christian when he wrote that book, and it's not written from a Christian perspective. But we, we do all, raise our babies according to... Well, why not pick some Christian that has the wisdom of God plus human wisdom too? You see. And unbelievers do not understand spiritual truth because they live in the flesh. And the flesh cannot understand spiritual truth, friend. And that's why, you know, if I had to go to court before a jury or for a judge and I did not know whether they were Christians or not, I would not have a, a comfortable feeling with that because you never know what an unsaved man might decide and rule and what his perspective might be. You never know what 12 human beings in 2001 might agree to. And it is better system than, than some of the systems of uh, tyranny that, that men have lived under. And I'm not saying that Americans aren't blessed by their judicial system, although we have departed from the rule of law and we have something else today in our courts and it's not executing justice in many cases because we're not following the laws that we say we believe. But an unsaved court is a scary thing. But it shouldn't be scary to sit down with people that know God and love you and love God and let truth of God mediate the disputes that you have among yourself civilly. Unbelievers are not in any way qualified like believers, especially making judgments of spiritual nature that occur in Christians' life. And he says something else here that's very important. He says in verse 7, Why do you not rather take the wrong and allow yourselves to be defrauded? If somebody treats you wrong, and you can't get that problem resolved with them, why don't you just say, well, I'm just going to leave that to the Lord. I'm going to be willing to forgive them if they ask me to, and I'm not going to hold any animosity in my heart to them, and, and I'm not going to treat them in a bad way because they've wronged me. And I am very much aware of this thing among society, and it's in the church now too. If you do me wrong, I'm going to get even with you. I'm going to get you back. And vengeance belongeth to the Lord. That's not the spirit of the Lord that feels like that, friend. And, and people may attack us as Christians, and, and even within the church, people may do us wrong. And it's not... It's not like we say, oh, oh, come here, let me put my arm around you and we can just go on like we always have, though you're kicking me in the face three times a day. I'm not saying that fellowship won't be affected if sin is not confessed and repented of. But I am saying this, friend, that we can't hold any bitterness towards them. Why don't we just take the wrong and suffer the loss? If we do that for Christ, and we are told that we're suffering for him and, and God will bless us for that. And so we see that there are standards and we see that the church is the place to settle disputes among believers and it's because of what we shall do in the future and the responsibilities. It's because of the judgment that God has commissioned us to do now and it's because of, that Christians are better judges than unbelievers. And if we can't get it resolved in the church, then we could take it to a civil court if, if we felt like it was important enough. But if it's a matter of just suffering financial loss, a couple hundred dollars, or even a thousand, why not as a Christian just leave that up to the Lord and say, well, I wasn't treated right and God knows it, but it's just money. And I, I, I'll take the loss and trust God to make it up because I'm doing the right thing. God help us to have standards and principles in our Christian life today and to have the love of Jesus that controls our attitudes and our actions. Amen.